Good morning, everyone. My name is Federica Cristani, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you today at this seminar, which is hosted by the Center for International Law of the Institute of International Relations in Prague. Today, we are delighted to host Professor Stefan Kirchner from the Arctic Center at the University of Lapland, who is going to present on present and future international Arctic law. Stefan Kirchner is a research professor of Arctic law and head of the Arctic Governance Research Group at the Arctic Center of the University of Lapland in Finland. And he's also adjunct professor of fundamental and human rights at the law faculty of the University of Lapland. He has taught at universities in Gießen, Göttingen, Kiev, Torino, and Nuuk, and he's currently visiting professor at the University in Kharkiv and Kaunas. He's a member of the bar in Frankfurt am Main in Germany and has worked in government and corporate practice and has specialized in international and constitutional law, in particular in the field of environmental human rights. Today, he's going to talk on how international law contributes to the effective governance of the Arctic, which role non-Arctic states like China can play in the governance of the Arctic, and how the future of international Arctic governance might look like. So a super interesting and relevant topic. Just before we start, some practical issues for today's seminar. I will hand over to Stefan in a moment and he will present for 40 minutes or so, and then we will have some time for discussion. As this event is being live streamed on Facebook, you are very welcome to use the comment box on Facebook for any question, comments during or after the presentation. And I will hand over all comments and questions to Stefan at the end of his presentation. So please make use of the comment box. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Stefan. Thanks a lot for accepting this invitation and I'm very looking forward to the presentation and the discussion. Please Stefan, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation, especially thanks to Dr. Cristiani for making it possible that I get to speak to you today about a region which has been pretty much the inspiration for my research for the better part of the last decade. What I want to talk today is very much a work in pro uh, progress um, as it relates to my own teaching activities in the past, especially in Greenland, and an upcoming book I'm currently working on. The the topic of my talk today is the present situation and the future, the potential future of international Arctic law. Unlike other fields of international law, like the law of the sea, human rights law, space law, and so on, there is no such thing as one fixed set of norms called international Arctic law. Rather, it is a cross-cutting approach to different fields, different sections of international law, which are particularly relevant for the Arctic region. What I want to show you in the next around 40 minutes is that Arctic law is broader than we often believe, also than many lawyers in the Arctic often believe, and that it, in the future it will also be more and more relevant for scholars, scholars and practitioners also outside the Arctic. When people, especially elsewhere in Europe, outside Northern Europe, ask what I do for a living and they say it's Arctic law, there are basically just two reactions. Either there's utter confusion, what on earth is Arctic law? Um, or there's an immediate sense of wonder. If you think of the Arctic, we all have an idea about the Arctic in our heads. We think of polar bears, we think of reindeer, snow, ice. Uh, um, endless summer nights right now where it doesn't really get dark for months on end for half a year at the North Pole, but even in Northern Europe for three for three months or longer, it really doesn't get dark anymore. Or the polar nights, this time of darkness, or the what's called in Finnish the Kamos period, is weird feeling where it's almost dark but, or doesn't really get light anymore in autumn. The Arctic for a lot of people is a mythical place or an almost mythical place. We have, of course, a lot of natural wonder in the Arctic. We have biodiversity, we have extreme climates. We have a world which is like nothing else we have on this planet. And at the same time, this is a world which is disappearing. It's a world which is ending because of climate change, its cultures, which are disrupted because of climate change. But for a lot of people, 
it's also a sense of opportunity. The Arctic Ocean is going to be ice free fairly soon, at least in the summer months. We'll get to that in a moment. For the first time in human history, we are going to, we are witnessing the emergence of a new ocean. The Arctic might be at the periphery for a lot of people in a geographical sense, especially when we look from the national power centers, even when we look from Arctic countries. Think of Canada or Russia or Norway. The capital cities are far away from the Arctic regions of these countries. But the Arctic is very much at the center of international attention, given that it is a relatively small region with a small population, around 4 million people living north of the Arctic Circle. The region gets a lot of attention, and one of the reasons for this is climate change. Human-made climate change fundamentally changes the Arctic. It changes conditions for life in the Arctic, for humans and animals alike. Right now, the Arctic is warming three times as fast as the global average. Until the end of this century, we are looking at global warming of around four, maybe five degrees centigrade. For the Arctic, we are going to look at 12 degrees centigrade plus, in addition to the temperature levels from the pre-industrial area. This is something that we can already feel today. Just a few years ago, the average temperature in the town where I'm working, Rovani, northern Finland, was plus 0.1 degrees. Today, it's already plus 1.8 degrees. This, these changes are already there, they're already happening. To give you a bit of comparison, um, in Prague, the annual average temperature is plus 9.8 degrees. If you add another maybe 10 degrees or so by the end of the century for northern regions, you will see that the climate is changing fundamentally. And that's not only the warming temperatures, it's really a fundamental change in the biosphere and the plants which can grow there and the animals which can survive there. It means more weather extremes. We see much more wildfires, for example, than in the past. A few years ago, so wildfires were something that we saw in the summer month in places like Spain or Portugal. In the last years, we've seen them continuously in Russia, in Sweden, in Finland, in Canada. There are now major wildfires happening every summer north of the Arctic Circle. That's something that basically didn't happen in the past. And we're going to see the disappearance of the sea ice in the Arctic. In a few years, at least in the summer months, sea ice will basically be gone in the Arctic Ocean. It's estimated right now that there will be some remnants of summer sea ice north of Greenland and Canada, but the biggest part of the Arctic is going to be ice-free in the summer months. This is a trend which is accelerating. Right now, for example, the sea ice melt in the Laptev Sea is starting roughly two months earlier than it should be. Right now, we see that even our own models, old, relatively speaking, scientific models, which are just a few years old, they don't function anymore because the CIS is melting so rapidly. This means that a lot is changing in the Arctic already right now. Of course, it's easy to see first and foremost the iconic animal species, like the polar bears, for example. But climate change also has an impact on the life of people in the Arctic especially for the indigenous peoples of the circumpolar Arctic, um, who've lived in the region for thousands of years. Traditional ways of life become threatened because what you know, what you've learned from your family, from your ancestors about your natural environment, all of this suddenly, is, it does not really apply anymore. Places where you could cross the ice at a certain time of the year are no longer safe to cross. Animals behave in different ways. Plants might not grow there anymore. They might get replaced by other plants, things like that. This threat to the Arctic is not new, and it is, has been known for some time. In fact, seal hunting in the Arctic was one of the first reasons for environmental protection standards, even though it was not called at that time because it was seen more from a natural resources perspective. Since the 70s, we have a polar bear treaty regulating the hunt of polar bears. 
And since the end of the Cold War, the Arctic has really developed into a zone of cooperation. Remember that during the Cold War, the Arctic was, of course, very much part of this global confrontation between East and West. In the last 30 years or so, this has changed fundamentally, starting with Mikhail Gorbachev's speech in Murmansk in the um, 80s, we now have developed what's often called a zone of peace. The Arctic is characterized by cooperation across political borders. There are significant political differences between the different Arctic countries, especially between the Western countries and Russia. But nevertheless, there is cooperation in areas which are of common concern. For example, when it comes to maritime safety, to preventing oil pollution, or to search and rescue operations. Just the other day, Norway and Russia conducted a major search and rescue exercise, for example, in the Arctic. This sense of cooperation is something that has become enormously important for the Arctic region, and which has been built on top of cross-border cooperation, which has been existing in the region before. From a legal perspective, the sense of cooperation has also translated or been translated into an increasing cooperation in unusual ways. There has emerged now in the last quarter of a century a distinct field of law, international Arctic law, which is concerned with the specific questions which are shared by Arctic communities. Especially international human rights law is an important part of Arctic law, as is indigenous rights law. Any legal system in Arctic law is the same in that way. At the end of the day, any legal system is meant to serve the people in a specific society. It's meant to serve the improvement of the human condition. And that is what Arctic law contributes to. It does so in ways which might be unusual when compared to regional cooperation elsewhere because of a much stronger reliance on cooperation rather than institutions. Arctic law and the research of Arctic law requires very much a practice-oriented approach. Arctic law researchers cannot afford to be in a purely academic bubble and not look at the reality on the ground. Rather, a lot of the inspiration for the development of Arctic legal norms comes from the needs of the people who live in the Arctic. Now, that said, not all norms which apply in the Arctic are actually made in the Arctic. Many of the legal challenges that we encounter in the Arctic, they also exist elsewhere in other peripheral regions. For example, when we look at the availability of services, the legal relationship between centers and peripheries. And of course, we still have challenges between Arctic states. We have serious political differences, which have grown only worse in last years, especially in the context of the invasion in Ukraine, the ongoing conflict there, which has been started by Russia, and in this context, we have to see that cooperation still prevails. And that is something that makes the Arctic region very special, but that also makes it necessary to explain the particular approach in the Arctic, especially to people from the outside. Because here, cooperation is not seen as a form of appeasement, but rather as a form of moving forward despite differences. The Arctic has an opportunity also to serve as a trade place in many regards, especially when it comes to international legal standards, which can later become elsewhere too. We have seen this, especially in the context of indigenous rights. In the context of cases under Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which protects minorities, but also covers indigenous peoples, we have seen a large amount of litigation coming from people from the European Arctic, especially indigenous litigants from Finland and Sweden, from the Finnish and Swedish sites of Sápmi, the home area of the Sámi people. To this day, indigenous Sámi litigants and experts play an important role in moving international rights law forward. 
a lot of the case law on Article 27 ICCPR would not have happened without the active involvement of indigenous persons from the Arctic. And we have a similar potential in other fields, for example, in international environmental law, especially when it comes to protecting the marine environment. But also with information standards, think of the Aarhus and ESPO conventions, which deal with access to information on one hand and environmental impact assessment on the other hand. These forms of cooperation between the Nordic countries in particular have already shown that the region has a lot of potential to serve as a model region for other parts of the world. One of the reasons for this is that the overwhelming majority of Arctic states are committed to legal standards such as human rights and the rule of law, with a notable exception, sadly, right now of the Russian Federation. And the cooperation cannot cover up the fact that this is not a perfect system. In particular, indigenous persons, a lot of people, especially in Russia, do not live in freedom. They don't enjoy human rights um, as much as they should do from the legal perspective. Keep in mind, Russia, of course, is in party to the European Convention on Human Rights and the ICCPR. But also elsewhere, we have legacies of massive human rights violations. These legacies are dealt with slowly, but there's now a clear trend, for example, the Truth Commission in Finland and the stronger look at the rights of indigenous peoples in Canada, especially after the shocking revelations a few days ago. There's a trend now that the past is also given more attention, that human rights violations are taken more seriously than in the past. It is a slow process. And for many people, justice comes too late. But it is nevertheless a process which slowly is going in the right direction. This cooperation in the Arctic is sometimes challenged. It's challenged by different political attitudes. Think of the situation I already mentioned with regard to Ukraine, or a few years before that, the war in Georgia. And of course, the overall political situation that um, we have Russia on one hand, number of NATO countries on the other hand, and um, neutral Sweden and Finland as well in the Arctic. However, there is a basic level of trust. Trust which in different settings might not exist in the same way. This level of trust also makes it possible to let fault lines, to let differences emerge if necessary. For example, two years ago, the Arctic Council, the key forum for governance in the Arctic, had its biennial meeting in Rovaniemi in Finland. And for the first time ever, the representatives of the Arctic states did not manage to adopt a declaration at the end of that meeting. Now, just recently, the next one meeting was in Reykjavik and was another declaration adopted, showing that the whole system is getting a bit more on track, back on track. But one of the key reasons for these differences two years ago were disagreements about climate change, human-made climate change, and how to deal with it. That's probably right now an even bigger challenge than other political differences, because climate change is a problem that affects the Arctic significantly. Right now, there are different approaches to climate change. For some, this is an economic opportunity. For others, it's really the end of a lifestyle. International law has a role to play in this regard. In the Arctic, that role works a bit, this, the function of international law is a bit different. The key forum, as I mentioned, for Arctic law or for Arctic governance is the Arctic Council. It is not an international organization in the classical sense of the term. And the focus in the Arctic is really on cooperation rather than institutions. Nevertheless, within the framework of the Arctic Council, a number of non-binding um, documents have been created. And the member states, the eight, eight Arctic countries, they've used the Arctic Council as a forum in which they've negotiated international treaties. They're, those are not treaties made by the Arctic Council, but the Arctic Council has served as a forum to make these treaties possible. But we'll get to that in a moment. 
international Arctic law has multiple dimensions. There are the two main factors which determine all of this, and that's climate change, but also globalization. To a certain degree, climate change and globalization make the Arctic a little bit less special than they used to be, when, especially when compared to nearby Arctic regions. Today, it's much easier to fly to northern Norway or northern Canada. People come there um, for tourism, for example, at least did prior to the pandemic. Um, it is more normal to, to see the Arctic in a way. Climate change will also make the Arctic more normal. Parts of Finland within 50 years have a climate like um, areas along the Baltic Sea, for example, a place like Latvia, for example, in the future right now. Um, this normalization of the Arctic also impacts the people who live there. Traditions are at risk of being lost. Things develop further, economies develop further. This normalization of the Arctic is also um, yeah, affecting the way we talk about Arctic law and the way Arctic law is created. So far, Arctic law has had a strong emphasis on the issues which are relevant, especially for the Arctic. But normalization also means that in the future, norms will become more relevant, which are more commonly used also outside of the Arctic. Issues will become more relevant, which are of global concern. Think of international trade law, for example. The, uh, is this idea that Arctic law should be made in the Arctic, but that has never really been the case. And especially when you look at things like the law of the sea, for example, you see that this is really an illusion. The people of the Arctic have a limited role in shaping international Arctic law. The Arctic Ocean is an ocean like all others, and with every day it becomes more and more so. And of course, the international law of the sea is not regional, but global, mainly through the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, a truly global legal instrument. Within the Arctic Council, Arctic states have a forum which they can create some norms, though that was not the original intention of the Arctic Council. It was never really intended as an institution which helps um, the creation of norms, but it has emerged into a forum for discussion and cooperation and legally binding treaty norms have been the tool of choice for Arctic states. The Arctic law is becoming less of an exception, but more normal when compared to other aspects of public international law. For example, by an increasing reliance on hard law and treaty law. It will, however, retain a regional element. Think, for example, of regional seas programs elsewhere in the world. In a similar way, we will have a regional element in Arctic law also in the future. Not all Arctic law is created under the auspices of the Arctic Council. For example, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which creates a moratorium in fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean, so in the high seas part of the Arctic Ocean, that has not been created within the Arctic Council context, but involving Arctic states as well as non-Arctic actors, which are particularly interested in the region. The same applies on a more global scale to the already mentioned UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but think also of indigenous rights like the ILO Convention 169, environmental law, climate change law, animal law, trade law, and so on. These global norms will play a greater and greater role in the Arctic in the future. On a more technical level, we see that international law reacts to specific problems, for example, in the field of maritime safety. Maritime safety, of course, being at the, one of the core issues in Arctic law, because the Arctic Ocean forms the heart of the region. A lot of communities along the coastlines are dependent on the ocean. And the Arctic Ocean as an ecosystem is also particularly vulnerable, especially to oil spills. 
We have these more technical approaches, which are supported by the, the science-based approach used by institutions like the Arctic Council to tackle specific problems. And these technical approaches also make it easier for states to cooperate because they are often seen as less politicized than other issues. The term normalization, which I just used, therefore also has a second meaning, a greater emphasis on norms, norms and rights. Norms in the sense of binding legal norms, so not just recommendations and guidelines. A good example for this is the Polar Code. The Polar Code entered into force on January the 1st, 2017, so four and a half years ago almost, and it contains norms which aim at enhancing safety of ships, ship operations at sea in the Arctic and um, in the Southern Ocean, but it also aims at ensuring better protection of polar marine environments. The Polar Code is based on a long list of recommendations and non-binding guidelines. So this did not come out of a vacuum, but rather was built on top of existing soft law. This trend towards more hard law is something that we can also see elsewhere in the Arctic, for example, with the Central Arctic Ocean's fisheries agreement. In that sense, Arctic law is maturing somewhat. It is moving away from the relatively soft approach of the early years, and it finds its place in international law as a whole. Of course, the connections between law and policy in the Arctic are still very close, and soft law continues to play an important role. Um, but right now, Arctic law, international Arctic law, is really moving from its early phase, what I would call the foundational constitutional phase, to more practical phase. From the phase where there was this question, how do we actually cooperate with each other in the Arctic, despite our differences, to really more practical issues how can we use international law to solve issues to enhance human safety in the Arctic and so on? The Polar Code or the evolution of indigenous rights, so there are good examples for that. And with this normalization, there's now also a chance to look close, more closely at the rights aspects. How do these norms actually generate rights for individuals, for groups? And that makes it much easier to transfer this international set of norms also back down on the national level where they can be made truly useful. But what is the content of Arctic law? So far we've talked about cooperation and different issues that could be tackled. Right now, I see seven aspects of public international law which are particularly important for the future of Arctic law. And of course, climate change being a key driver for, the, for these um, very specific needs. The term international Arctic law describes what I would say is a set of rules which are part of public international law. So this is not apart from international law, it's clearly part of public international law. But then there are seven facets which are particularly important. First of all, general public international law like the law of treaties and of international organizations. And that's also what I would call the general part of international Arctic law. The special part of international Arctic law then consists of norms which are more specific. In between, we have a quasi-constitutional layer of international Arctic law in the form of international human rights law in particular, the international legal norms concerning the rights of indigenous peoples. The special norms of international Arctic law concern issues such as international environmental law, international law of the sea, international trade law. Now, especially the international law of the sea and international environmental law, I think these are things which are relatively straightforward, where it's clear also from the outside why they matter for the Arctic. International trade law is an aspect that also in the Arctic is often overlooked. We are in the very comfortable position in the European Arctic of having nearly perfect economic integration between the Nordic countries. Even though Iceland and Norway are not in the EU, they're so integrated um, that there is really 
no difference there anymore, thanks to the European Economic Area. Um, with Canada, we have CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, which is provisionally enforced, at least insofar as the EU is, um, has the competence. Unfortunately, not yet completely. And there is a specific type of openness. Um, borders don't really matter that much, at least on the region. So from prior to the pandemic, it did not really make a difference if you live in Sweden and work in Finland or the other way around. The big exception, of course, is the Russian Federation. And especially now with the sanctions regimes against Russia, we see that this is something that has an impact on local economies as well. Over the last few years, economies in the Arctic, in the European high north in particular, they've adapted to this. But there was certainly a challenge in particular in 2014 with the early EU sanctions against Russia. Um, Trade law therefore remains important. Also, inter intra Arctic trade or trade between different parts of the Arctic is not as developed as it could be, especially when we look at Northern Europe and Canada, for example. Um, so, that certainly is something where there's a lot of room for improvement, especially when we look at the situation in Greenland, which is still very dependent also in economic and trade terms on Denmark with a lot of goods being transported by ship from Denmark, even though Canada is right next door. And when I mention the transport of goods by ships, you see that we always come back to the sea because the sea is so fundamental for the Arctic, even parts of the Arctic, which are not as close to the coastlines. Um, strongly related to that is maritime safety. Now. And as an evolution of that international disaster risk reduction and safety. Now we mentioned the polar code, but there's also, for example, a search and rescue agreement um, between the states which make up the Arctic Council and the frequent exercises between different countries and mutual assistance in case of large scale emergencies. Finally, we have international science cooperation law. Scientists from across the Arctic, from the different Arctic countries, have specific rights to cooperate with their colleagues elsewhere. Um, an issue which is also becoming more challenging now with regard to the Russian Federation. But nevertheless, there too, the Arctic Council has used an inter, or the member states rather, rather have um, created an international treaty which facilitates ongoing international efforts to understand the Arctic better. These facets or elements of international law, they are of course not the totality of international Arctic law. So Arctic law can be much more than that. And what we are building right now, and keep in mind that this is a process that has just been going on for th around 30 years. The Arctic Council just turned, um, it's just turned 25 years old this year. Um, this is something which, provides a fundamental basis on which states in the region and also non-state actors because indigenous representative organizations play an important role in the Arctic Council, how they can tackle the problems of the future. However, um, the current system of international Arctic law is not closed. It's open to inputs from other actors, from actors from um, both non-state actors, like the indigenous representative organizations in the Arctic Council, the input from experts and scientists, the key role, but also um, with regard to outside actors. It's important for the states of the Arctic to ensure that their commitment to the rule of law, to international law in general, to human rights and democracy, that this is something that is maintained also in the future, especially when there are challenges to these concepts coming from other countries, both within the Arctic, like Russia, and from outside the Arctic. International Arctic law so far has been developed to a certain degree, or to a large degree at least, with the needs of the people who live in the Arctic in mind. 
right now, there's an increasing pressure from outside actors, outside countries, to be part of these decision-making processes. Uh, Arctic Council, for example, has so-called observers. In a large number of non-Arctic states have re in recent years sought and been granted observer status. The idea being that outside countries do want to have a seat on the table, want to be in the room when decisions are made, even though they're not active members. The role of the People's Republic of China in this regard is something that has been a significant concern for a number of um, policymakers across the Arctic in different Arctic countries. And there's a worry among a lot of people in the Arctic that there might be too much outside influence. And for that reason, it is important to see which decisions are made based on which legal instruments. Are we talking about regional instruments or global instruments like the UN Convention on Law for Sea? Remember that for a long time, the people who live in the Arctic did not have a chance to decide their own fates. With the exception of Iceland, which was um, uninhabited when it was first settled by Europeans, all other parts of the Arctic have made a colonial experience. In many Arctic regions, these experiences continue to this day in the form of discrimination, in the form of violence, and so on. You might have heard of the large number of murders of Canadian indigenous women, and so on. So this is not something that is in the distant past, but something that remains a problem today. It remains a legal challenge also today. Of course, they might explain to a certain degree why there's a, sometimes a wariness when it comes to outside influences. Of course, outside influences are at times seen also as an economic opportunity. Think, for example, of the current situation in Greenland, which is slowly moving away towards independence from Denmark, but which does not yet have the economic resources to do so. Governance in the Arctic also means a strong emphasis on autonomy and local decision making. We see this especially in Greenland, which is, as I just said, moving towards independence, but also in Canada, where the um, Nunavut region, has, Nunavut territory has a lot of autonomy compared to the rest of the nation. These are only small steps, but they're steps towards recognizing or reconstituting the original lost sovereignty of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. If Arctic communities want to decide the future of the Arctic on their own, they have to do this right now because the outside influence, the outside interest rather in the Arctic is growing. Already mentioned the political differences. And this certainly is something that could be used by outside actors to sow discord and to weaken the decision-making structures. It is certainly conceivable that in the future, outside countries like China, but also European countries could seek a stronger role in the Arctic. Right now, the European Union's approach is very much um, it's on soft norms and um, what I would call a friendly cooperation, um, especially through the two EU member states, Sweden and Finland. But that also is something where not all Arctic states might necessarily see eye to eye. In the Arctic, we have a long history of open borders, of cooperation. This has changed now briefly due to the pandemic, but overall the vision that unites the people of the Arctic is one of cooperation. Cooperation in a very harsh environment in very challenging circumstances, and in circumstances which only become worse due to climate change. Arctic law has a role to play in improving the situation and in supporting the people who live in the Arctic. The question for the international community today is whether the people who live in the Arctic actually get the chance to continue to make decisions 
for their own home region, for the sustainable development of their region, or whether, for example, the Arctic Ocean will be regulated like any other ocean um, around the world as well. Climate change and globalization already changed the Arctic in fundamental ways. And it remains to be seen whether Arctic law will remain a tool for Arctic communities to defend regional interests, or whether it will just be basically a local application of global standards. What is important is that Arctic law is a very practical field of law. It is not disconnected from the people who live there, but Rather, it is, it aims to serve the needs of the people who live there. And that's something we see in the types of international treaties that have been concluded, for example, regarding oil spill prevention or search and rescue operations. International law is needed today more than ever before as a protection of human rights and the rule of law. With climate change, we move closer and closer to major challenges, not just for people in the Arctic, but worldwide. We see the effects of climate change in the Arctic a bit earlier than we might see them elsewhere. And there's a chance for Arctic communities and the legal community of the Arctic to also create norms which can be trailblazers for um, the solution of these problems elsewhere in the future. In how far this will really happen, depends also on conditions which are created outside of the Arctic region. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Stefan. That was a really super interesting and super rich presentation. I think uh, you, uh, you gave us a lot uh, to think about. And uh, I have also some uh, questions for you, but first uh, I will turn to the questions from uh, the public. I see that we already have one question and uh, I am inviting uh, all of you to use uh, the comment box in Facebook to, to raise your comments and questions. Uh, so I will start with the first one. Would you be in favor of developing in the Arctic area a similar legal system as currently exists in the Antarctic? such as the Antarctic Treaty, albeit maybe unrealistic, uh, would you see it beneficial? That's a really good question. And it's something that has been discussed for quite some time, until a few years ago. The key difference between the Arctic and Antarctica from a legal perspective is of course that the Arctic is a region where states exercise sovereignty. Unlike Antarctica, we have claims, but this for practical purposes beyond national jurisdiction. Here in the Arctic, we have nation states, and we don't really have um, areas which are beyond the sovereignty of, of the nation states. There's one island which is claimed by Denmark on behalf of Queen and Canada alike, which has a bit of an unclear legal status. Um, but apart from, I don't know how many square kilometers this is, that might be two square miles or something. So we're talking about a uh, really tiny island in the Arctic. Um, but apart from that, the sovereignty questions are clear. There are some questions with regard to the exact locations of continental shelves and so on, but there is not really much in terms of unclaimed space. There is only the high seas part of the Central Arctic Ocean. Therefore, the whole approach that's found in Antarctica is not suitable to the Arctic. The Arctic has been home for millions of people, and those people they trace their histories back, many of them back um, thousands of years in different parts of the Arctic. It's home to people who just arrived there recently and people who have long histories there. So the idea of an Arctic treaty has long been discussed, but it has been discarded and it has rather fallen out of favor in the last few years, simply because it's not feasible. The Arctic is not an empty space. It's home to a lot of people and the regulatory approach simply would not fit. What could make sense would be to designate the Arctic Ocean, for example, as a particularly sensitive sea area, which would legally be possible once the marine traffic would increase to a point that it would endanger 
the um, Arctic marine environment. Or there could be additional regional um, environmental law treaties similar to the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. So that's something that I can envisage for the future, but not a whole legal regime like that for Antarctica. I hope that answers the question. Thanks a lot. Uh, I see that there is also another question. Is there a need uh, for an, an, an uh, Arctic international organization or the current Arctic Council functioning uh, as a forum is sufficient? Yeah, that's actually a, not an easy question. Um, it's easy to misunderstand the Arctic Council as a de facto international organization, but they've been very careful making clear that they are not really that. Um, it was already a big step for the Arctic Council to have a permanent secretariat, for example. Um, and there have been efforts which, at least from for me as an outsider, create the impression that really a lot of care was taken to not appear to be an international organization. Um, and right now, I don't think it would be helpful, no. Um, at least there's no real need. What there would be a need for would be better cooperation, more cooperation in the long run. Um, and to make sure that this trust between partners actually continues. That's something where I see the main problem now more domestically in the Russian Federation, the current government there. Um, we would need a stronger emphasis on respect on the rule of law, respect for human rights, respect for international legal standards. Because that, if that is lacking, then of course we would also see a lack of trust in a partner who is not committed to these things. Um, having a, an international organization in a formal sense might not give that many benefits to Arctic cooperation. What could be possible, again, similar to what I just said with regard to the regulatory approach in general, what could be possible would be more technical organizations. For example, when it comes to specific environmental standards, monitoring, and so on. So that's something where a more formalized cooperation would make sense. But a lot of that could happen through frameworks which already do exist. So there's not really a need to reinvent the wheel for the Arctic, so to say. Thanks a lot. And I have also a question is more, yeah, maybe maybe practical, um, maybe a curiosity question, because I have mentioned many times that Arctic law is very practical and uh, it needs uh, this practice, uh, a practical approach to also to understand the issues and to approach also the many questions. And uh, I know also in the Arctic Center actually is a multidisciplinary center with the researchers coming from humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences working on Arctic issues and also in your group you work together with also non-lawyers uh, in and uh, I'm just curious uh, how is it to work also with uh, non-lawyers in these Arctic issues which are uh, and I can imagine that there are lots of benefits uh, of course uh, in uh, working with person with a different background uh, are there also many, some challenges and how you address these challenges? Thanks. Yeah, I have the pleasure of um, coordinating a research group, which is very mixed and very international. We're around 30 people from, I think, 15 countries or so. Um, of course, um, it's a research group on governance, so there's an emphasis on lawyers and political scientists. But we also have a lot of, um, yeah, additional expertise, for example, from geographers, um, climate change experts, and so on. Um, I believe it's important to have these different views, these different perspectives, and also different backgrounds. Um, as lawyers, I think we often tend to speak a similar language. It's probably easier for a lawyer from, let's say, the Czech Republic to connect with a lawyer from the US than with a natural scientist from around the corner. Um, so yeah, of course, it's, it's sometimes difficult to um, start to speak the same language. But for me, that has always been one of the interesting things about working as a lawyer, that there's always this non-legal component. 
I mean, if you practice as a lawyer, you have to be able to explain things to the judge, to your client and so on. And if your client is, let's say, a company working in specific technical fields, you also have to get a certain amount of technical know-how and so on. Um, for me, that has always been one of the fascinating aspects um, of my own work um, as a practicing lawyer. And in this academic setting, I think it's wonderful that we have the opportunity to work in such an interdisciplinary way and to also learn from each other. Also, it helps to see a more complete picture. It helps us prevent just looking at something from one direction and yeah, limits the risk of being blind to parts of the problems, so especially when it comes to the needs of the people who live in the Arctic, for example. It's helpful to have people who have a background or good understanding of the practical side of problems. So I think yeah, to do good research in Arctic law and um, yeah, to make a valuable contribution, it's important to have this holistic approach to, have a, to try at least to get as complete a picture as possible. And it's a good opportunity to learn something new every day. Thanks a lot. And also, I had a, um, a question regarding the the, EU, the European Union approach to Arctic uh, issues. Uh, and actually, this relates also to uh, your recent uh, research that you have conducted with other researchers on, uh, on a report for the European Commission on EU actions and implications for the Arctic. And uh, you listed uh, some policy options uh, that uh, can uh, the European Union can adopt uh, to approach Arctic policies. Uh, and actually, I know that uh, uh, this report will be officially presented next week in another webinar. Uh, I was wondering whether maybe you can give us some insights from it, especially when uh, where do you think the European Union uh, should act more, and this action should actually be beneficial also for the Arctic. Uh, uh, for example, I saw that, uh, and it was quite uh, surprising for me that, uh, for example, you see that the uh, European Union is lacking an institution responsible for contacts for indigenous people. And I was wondering why the, is this uh, the case? Because they consider it a more a national issue or because it's more lack of uh, general awareness? Mm -hmm. With regard to indigenous people's rights, it's, first of all, it's important to remember that in the EU, we don't only have indigenous people in the Arctic, but also in French Guiana. That's something that I think is often forgotten that there are several indigenous peoples there in French Guiana, of course, being a full part of the European Union as well. Um, yes, it's often seen as falling within national um, competences, but also the relationships to indigenous people say, um, are affected in multiple ways. So it's very often the case that different um, institutions within the EU have to deal with indigenous um, communities, both within the EU and outside of the EU. So that might explain the lack of a bit of a coherent approach there. But what is important, however, is that the EU provides really tangible benefits also, that the remote parts of the European Union are not forgotten in Brussels. And that's a perception that I think is easy to get sometimes, but it really is not the case. There's significant funding, for example, for infrastructure, but also for projects such as, for example, on suicide prevention. Suicide is a major problem across the Arctic, um, in places like Northwest Russia and Greenland and Canada and Northern Europe have some of the highest suicide rates worldwide and the US funded project um, in that regard. So, but also infrastructure projects and so on. Um, so it's important to see that there are practical benefits coming from the European Union and that those remote areas of Northern Europe, they're not forgotten, far from it. But yeah, it's understandable that often Brussels might seem to be far away if you're somewhere in a small municipality in Northern Europe. Um, so I think it's also important that there's a ongoing communication. The EU, for example, communicates quite a lot with the Sami Council, the representative organization of the Sami people. Um, it's important that we keep these channels of communication open. And I think today this is easier than ever before. So it's important to remember that yeah, we don't 
let these contacts slip, but rather that we keep communicating and keep learning from each other. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we are quite uh, at uh, close the, uh, at the end of this uh, webinar, and uh, I would like uh, just to close uh, with a final question, since we are talking about the future of uh, international Arctic law. Just, uh, uh, just uh, what uh, would you be your vision uh, or your expectations of Arctic law, let's say in uh, 30 years uh, from now? What will be your wishes, uh, or will be yeah, what uh, what do you see for Arctic law? I think it's really difficult to look that far in the future. Um, actually, colleague and I tried exactly that for a, a book chapter, which is will be coming out later this year, early next year. Um, but at that point, just until I think it was 2035 or so. So for another, yeah, 14, 15 years. Um, and that already was a fairly difficult exercise. Um, if you look back 30 years, just after the end of the Cold War, I think it would have been impossible to really imagine how cooperation in the Arctic looks like. A lot of that is, of course, due to technical developments, especially when we think about um, internet communications, technology, and so on. Um, a lot of it is due to the pressing nature of climate change, which is not something that's happening in the future, but which has very real impacts on the people in the Arctic right now. Um, I think it's difficult to imagine or really accurately predict rather than um, rather how Arctic governance looks like in 30 years. If you ask me for a vision for um, what would be my ideal scenario, it would be a zone of peace, but one based on rule of law and respect for international law and human rights all over the Arctic. An area where sustainability is valued at least as much as development, because sustainable development is a major challenge for communities in the Arctic, especially for communities with um, populations that grow older, where young people don't find work anymore um, in their home regions, where there's work-related outward migration from the rural areas. Um, that might be a trend that could be changing. We've seen quite a bit already now in the pandemic that people work remotely, more flexibly, that location is less important. So that might be a great opportunity for a lot of communities in the Arctic as well. Um, when it comes to cooperation, I would hope for a continued trust and openness, and actually for an improvement when it comes to respect for human rights and a more active role for human rights and the protection of the natural environment. These are the main challenges I see, but also the fields where there's the greatest urgency. In the Arctic, everybody in one way or the other depends on nature. We're much more dependent on the nature and the climate than many other parts of the world. It's this dependency which also has to lead to more action. Action, limit climate change, mitigate climate change, and where it's not possible anymore to make it to at least help people to adapt to it. Also, Chain measures which will be taken to combat climate change will have impacts on local economies. That is something that also will have to be taken into account. It will have impacts on infrastructures and so on. So what I would hope for in 30 years is cooperation based on the rule of law, respect for international law and human rights, but also dedicated to preserving the natural environment of the Arctic for future generations and to sustainability in particular in light of the ongoing fight against climate change. Thanks a lot. I think uh, that's a, a perfect wrap up for our webinar. And uh, I, um, I really thank you so much, Stefan, for making I the time uh, for, to stay with us today and for this super interesting presentation, the discussion. Thanks to all the participants uh, for your comments and questions and for staying with us today. And thanks really so much, Teresa from the conference service team in Prague for making this event uh, practically possible. And I invite you, all of you to stay tuned for the next events of the Center for International Law, the Institute of International Relations in Prague. You can see all forthcoming events on the website and on the Facebook page of the Institute. So thanks so much again.
Take care and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.